Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers in Islam. I'm here to give a, a very brief talk on my journey to Islam and how Islam took me from the darkness into the light of Haq. Also, I want to discuss uh, and, ask, and raise the question did society or the system assist me in my jahiliya? And how Islam has the ability to change mankind and societies? First, I'll give you a little insight of uh, my growing up. I was raised by my grandparents. I didn't live with my parents. My father, he took off when I was about one and a half years old. So my mother was out working, trying to support me, and she thought it was best that I live with my grandparents. So uh, I think it was a wise choice. Alhamdulillah. Um, I got fond memories of my, uh, my grandfather. He was a very tall man, he was a science teacher, and he was a very interesting character, actually. Uh, he used to take me camping, and we used to dig for fossils, and he used to make uh, canoes and all these sorts of things. Uh, he was one who uh, would carry me, I've got a fond memory, he used to carry me on, my, uh, on, on his shoulders. And he used to point at the stars and talk about the planets, the universe, the earth. Uh, as, I mean, like I was like, three, four years old, and I just remember him doing that. And him telling me, uh, at that age, I always remember that, uh, that God was behind all this. He was the creator. Now, I never knew him as a Christian or, 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 or one who believed, but he believed that there was a creator. He didn't have any religion, but he did believe there was a creator. So from my very early days, I knew that uh, he would say things like, Allah is big and you can't imagine him. So there was no picture in my head who Allah was. I just knew that he was big and you can't imagine him. I've got a funny story to tell. Us. Uh, I was friends with a, a very good friend with a guy who lived a couple of doors up and his mother thought it was a good idea that I go to Sunday school with, with uh, my friend. And a uh, very funny story. I, I went to this Sunday school and there was like 10 or 12 kids sitting, in, sitting on the floor. And this uh, teacher, scripture teacher, she um, flipped this big sheet of paper over and had a picture of um, uh, Isa a.s. You know that picture that the Christians use where he's on the salib? Um, and he was there and he, she raised the question of, does anyone know who this is? Uh, a couple of kids put their hand up and they're saying it's Jesus and um, all these sorts of things. Um, but she was asking, she was getting to the point of who is he? And not many people knew what she was trying to get at. So she answered it for us. She said, this is your Lord. This is God. And without putting my hand up, I just rudely interrupted. And I said, that's not God. Uh, God, you can't imagine. He's big. And she kicked me out of the class. She totally kicked me out. And I thought I did something really, really wrong. But I just, that's what my grandfather said. So it has to be right, right? Um, so I got kicked out, and I was never to return to Sunday school. Alhamdulillah. So I was guided from a very young age by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Another story is, um, I used to play under sevens rugby league, and uh, my footy coach used to come and pick me up uh, for training once a week or twice a week. And it was late one time, and I was at the letterbox like always, with my footy boots on and my training stuff. Just a little kid, I must have been about six years old. And I saw my, uh, my friend pull in the driveway with his family and his sister and his mum and dad. And I remember uh, looking up to the skies, talking to God and saying, God, I want to live with my mum and dad. And uh, yeah, I remember that like it was yesterday. And I was talking with him. Anyway, my coach turned up and I jumped in the car, we went to training. And I didn't give it a second thought, but I, was, I used to talk to God. So I knew God existed. God existed. I knew he existed. I didn't know who he was, I didn't know anything about him, but I knew God existed. Um, now, later on in life, in my, uh, my, school year, my high school years and my being a young man in society, I'd have to say that I lived a very carefree, careless, and I'll even say sometimes ruthless life style. 
I was uh, drinking alcohol. If you think of drinking alcohol, think of everything that goes along with that when I say I was drinking alcohol. So you can think of the haram things that are attached to drinking alcohol. I was drugging, I was dealing with drugs, even from a young age. I dealt with drugs, my first experience with drugs, I was maybe 12 years old. So you can uh, see that I developed this, this drug problem at a very early stage in my life. Um, and when I say drugging, I mean everything associated with it. Now, you guys being Muslim, born into Islam, alhamdulillah, uh, you probably can't imagine what it would be like. Um, but I'll tell you, it's a very disgusting thing. It's a disgusting lifestyle. It, it got to the stage, it got to a really bad stage where it was a, um, a heavy drug addiction with very expensive drugs. Um, and uh, look, it, it, it ruins lives, it really does. Um, I was clubbing and everything associated with clubbing. So you, if you can imagine the music, the women, the drugs, the drinking, just clubbing. I'm sure you've all got a, a picture there. You've all seen those movies and Hollywood stuff. It's, it's sort of not like that at all, but anyway. Um, and my drug habit got that bad where I was actually um, doing petty crimes to support my habit. I was mugging people and getting money and any means necessary so I can get that drugs that I needed or what I thought I needed at the time. I only concerned, my only concern in life was about benefit. What benefited me is what I wanted to do. I leaded my own life through benefit. Uh, what conducted my life uh, was my desires. Whatever I desired, I did. What I thought was right, I did it. What I thought was wrong, I stayed away from it. Even though I was doing a lot of wrong things, but I was just harming myself, I wasn't harming anyone else. Uh, not until later on in life. And what I could say to that is that I was a product of the society. Now what I mean is I was a product of the society, as you see the environment that we live in, you, you, we see it every day in our lives. We look left, we see haram. We look right, we see haram. We look up, we look down, we see haram. We're surrounded by haram. So I was simply just a product of the society. This is how society shaped me. Okay? I know I got myself to blame partially, but the society, society played a major role, I think. Now, I just want to break that down, how my immoral, immoral behavior was a part of society. I had that uh, you only live once mentality. So you only live once, live it up, party hard. Let's, let's get drunk, let's do some drugs. Let's... We lived life ruthlessly and on the edge on a regular occasion. I had the same group of friends and we did the same thing, day in, day out. I lived a very materialistic li lifestyle. I was led by materialist materialistic things. I wanted the best sneakers, the best shoes, the best clothes, the labels. I was right into that. Uh, and that's also society dragged me into that. I thought that you have to look the part, right? So I would buy all these expensive clothes, or if I didn't buy them, I would steal them. I was pursuing wealth and happiness. I thought if I attain wealth, it would give me happiness. I was uh, uh, searching for the Aussie dream, if there is an Aussie dream, let's just say American dream, sounds better. <laughs> the American dream, or as Muslims, the American nightmare. And I was influenced by celebrities and rap stars. I was heavily into hip hop. I thought this is how I should live my life, like this. I thought this is how as a young man, this is what life is. Um, and all these things in society, like the wealth, I thought these, the wealth and looking the part and uh, this 
American dream, so call it. I thought this was a very important, very important part of your life. All these things, you have to have these possession, possessions to attain true success. It's funny how society itself determines for us what true success is. We know as Muslims uh, what true success is. But it's funny how society wants to mould you and determine for you what true success is. And they measure, it, measure success by the car that you drive, or the home, or the area in which you live, or your friends, or your associates, or the job that you have, your status in that job, your wealth. This is how they measure success, by the clothes that you wear, the image you carry. As Muslims, and as a Muslim now, we know that that is absolute rubbish, and that's not success at all. That's failure. Not that, as a Muslim, you can't attain nice things. Of course you can. But there's guidelines for us, that we, and there's red lines which we don't cross as believers. I like to call it this little catchphrase, I was a victim of the system. That's exactly what I was. I was a victim of the system. And I fell in and I got sucked in to all this delusion. I was heavily influenced by rap stars and hip hop scene. Absolutely. The shoes, the dress, I was going to concerts, I was even meeting rap stars. And for, some time, for a short time in my life I was actually writing lyrics myself. And uh, I wasn't just writing lyrics, I was actually writing political lyrics. I was exposing the injustice done by the indigenous peoples of this land. Exposing the history, the genocide, the deaths in custody, the stereotyping, the discrimination. Uh, just for a short time in my life, I really thought maybe I could change uh, the situation here. But that dream didn't go anywhere except for a backyard party. Uh, it didn't go beyond that, but um, it was a pretty interesting time in my life. The hip-hop scene, well, what does it promote? Music, dancing, women, bling-bling, um, the drug culture, uh, it, street crime and criminal behaviour. So I had all those traits and I carried them with me. In society, it's just a menace. Which, uh, it's, like I said, I was just a victim of the system. There come a stage in my life where I tamed a very, very serious, the, the drug habit got very, very serious now. Um, it come to a point where I was actually living on the street for some, some time. I was showering once a week I was living in a garage with a friend. We would find couches on the street, and they were our couches. We didn't have a toilet. So I'll lose, let you use your own imagination. It was a disgusting life. I still obtained a job, and I was making very good money in this job, but I still had to steal from people and be a menace in society and do street crime to support my habit. The habit and the money that I was spending on drugs per week was phenomenal. It was, it was really bad. Where I couldn't even afford a home to live in because my, dr my drugs and, and was more important to me. I didn't think I could live without them. That, that's the state it put me in. It really damaged me. I come to the stage in my life where I wanted to change. I needed to change. I wanted to change, I just didn't know how. I didn't know where to turn or who to go to. I got a surprise visit from my auntie and she saw the state I was in. She was a nurse for 30 plus years and she sees this thing all the time. And she wanted to help me and she told me when she saw me this particular day, she said, you're moving in with me. And I said, no, 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 I'm all right, I don't have a problem, knowing that my problem was severe. And she wouldn't take no for an answer. She was there the very next day and she was packing, packing my things. At this stage in my life, I lived in a unit in Parramatta, a small one-bedroom unit. 
The very next day, she's packing my things. And I started helping her. And I started thinking, well, maybe here's my opportunity to change. So I started packing the truck. And I drove my car up behind her all the way into the Blue Mountains where she lived. And I'm driving up there behind her in the truck. And I remember thinking on the freeway, look, if I ever need my drugs, I guess I can always leave when my auntie's at work, take a trip down Sydney for an hour, get what I need, go up there and pretend nothing ever happened. Funny uh, story, I, I got to the, uh, uh, the mountains and I went to get a drink, drink in the kitchen and she was out pulling the leads and the battery out of my car. So she had a master plan. I had a plan but she had the master plan. Anyway, I pretty much went cold turkey. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone go to cold turkey, but it's a, it's a terrible state to be in. It's, um, I had the shakes. I would sleep all day and I'd be awake all night. Uh, my life was totally upside down. I was angry, frustrated, and I put my auntie through a pretty rough time, to be honest with you. But she persevered. She, she made healthy food for me. She gave me vitamins. She talked with me. Yeah, she helped me out a lot. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. She pulled me through this rut that I was in. Anyway, it came a point in my life where I started feeling good about myself. I had the confidence back. I was looking healthy. I joined a gym up at Katoomba. I was going there two, two times, three times a week. I started taking shape again. And I felt amazing. I haven't felt like this for a long, long time. I've been abusing drugs from a very young age and I haven't felt normal for so long. I was trying to escape reality all the time. That's what the drinking and the drugs was doing. It was, it was temporary happiness, just to escape the reality for the moment, for the time. But when you come off your high, it's back to reality. So what you want to do is you just want to get on that high again. Anyway, my uh, auntie shouted herself on a holiday to, uh, and rightly so, she went to Fiji with her husband. So I was all alone in the house. Because I cleaned up my life, I thought it's a good time to maybe clean up some of these old boxes I had lying around the place. And I come across an old diary. And in the back of this diary, I had a checklist that I never ticked off. And this checklist wrote, stop drugs, no alcohol. Don't do crime and be a menace to society. Eat healthy, join the gym. And I'm ticking off these lists. And they go, and finally can I tick off this list. So I'm crossing them out and I'm ticking them off. And the last thing on the list was find God. Find Allah. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I do that? How do I find God? I knew he, I knew he existed. But is there a 1 800 number you call? I mean, who do I go to? Who do I ask? Who do I turn to? And I was confused. And I really wanted to tick this thing off my list because I ticked everything else off and I felt good and I felt like I needed a new start and I felt strong and I knew I didn't want to go back to that life. And I really wanted to tick that off. So I went outside. And I don't know if any of you guys have been in the wilderness, the outback. But it's silence all around you. All you hear is a couple of crickets, maybe a fox or a rabbit, you know, in the woods. Uh, just dead silence. And I remember sitting on this rock just looking down, thinking, how am I going to contact God? How am I going to find my creator? And I was looking down at the ground, and then, subhanAllah, Allah brought my attention to the night sky. And it blew me away. It was the most beautiful sky I've ever seen in my life. Still to this day, I've not seen a sky like it. I remember it like it was yesterday. The blackness of the light was the darkest of black. It was a dark night. And the stars, there was millions of them. And they were huge. And they were sparkling. And it was, it was just beautiful. 
And I looked up to the sky and I went, that's a beautiful sky. Oh my God, look at that. And then I caught myself saying, oh my God. And then from there, I thought I just addressed God. So I put my hands up like this. I've never seen anyone do this. I grew up with Muslims all my life. But to be honest with you, I never saw them pray. I never seen anyone pray. And I did this. It was just a natural instinct to do this. And I addressed my Rabb, my God, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I asked for his forgiveness. And I asked him to help me through the times uh, I needed him. And I thanked him for helping me through the hardships. And I thanked him for helping me get my life back together. And I pretty much just bared my heart with him. And honestly, I was crying like I've never cried before. It was like Niagara Falls. I couldn't stop the tears. And I was just pleading with him and I was asking him to keep me straight and to guide me to the true religion. And if he guided me to the true religion, I made a promise to him that I would never leave it. I just asked for his guidance. I asked him to keep me strong and, and not to fall back in the pitfalls that I was in. The lead up to Islam, I moved back down to Sydney and I went to go visit a very old friend of mine. He was a Christian Lebanese guy, but we were very close. And I knocked on his door and I haven't heard, he hasn't heard from me for many years. And he couldn't believe his eyes when he opened the door. He thought I was dead or locked up. He had no idea that I was even on the planet. He couldn't contact my mother. He didn't know where I was. He, was, he even said he was very worried about me for a long time. Anyway, he was, he was doing business with this Muslim guy, this practicing Muslim guy. And I asked him, um, prior to meeting the Muslim guy, I asked him if he could give me a job and he gave me some work and I needed a place to stay and he, he got me, uh, my friend got me his auntie's place, a little granny flat out the back of Maryland, in Maryland, and I lived out there, for, uh, moved in there, saw the place, moved in, and I started working with my friend, and he was doing business with this practicing Muslim guy, and I got to meet him on a few occasions, because I would meet like two or three times a week, and this Muslim guy had an amazing character, a character that I just fell in love with. He was an absolute gentleman. He shook my hand, he smiled, he spoke, and when he spoke, he always spoke a word of wisdom. The way he spoke was very uh, profound. And just his character, and I'm saying to my friend, who's this guy? And he goes, oh, this is a guy I'm going to go into business with. He's a Muslim. I said, his character is amazing. He goes, yeah, no, he's very trustworthy. That's why I want to do business with him. I'm like, oh, I said, do it. I said, this guy, I like him. I like There's something about him. I like him. And I, over the time I got to know him, I would watch him wash up and he would go pray. And I started questioning what he was doing. And he said he was worshipping his, his, his Rabb, his Lord. And I would ask him questions of, uh, you know, who you're worshipping uh, and, and, um, and how many times a day you've got to do this and all these sort of things. And the way he answered always fulfilled my heart as being true. It just made common sense. It just made sense. He had a character that I wanted for myself. I seen this Muslim brother, Islam, his religion, shaped him as a very strong, firm, a real man. And that's what I wanted for myself. Later on, I saw the way he treated his children, his wife, and it was amazing. And the way they respected him his wife and his children respected him. It was something I've never seen before. The family unit he had, I've never seen a family like that ever. It was very attractive. So I've been asking him questions for a couple of months. And uh, in that time, I also bumped into a few Christian priests along the way. I remember being at a garage one time, attaining a pink slip, and there was this Christian 
guy dressed up in the full black abaya with his funny hat and he had this massive salib. Like it was huge. It was like, for sure you'll be knocking people out when he walks down the street. Um, I, I, at, at, the, at the time I even thought maybe it could have been the original one. <laughs> anyway, I, I asked him the question, I, was, I wanted to ask him what his perception, perception of Jesus is. And um, he pretty much just tapped me on the shoulder and said, have faith jumped in the car and took off. And I'm like, that's not an answer. You know, I was left just standing there. He just took off. Like, he didn't even spend the time. Like, I was asking him, trying to ask him questions. He could see that I was sincere. I just wanted some knowledge. And he took off. From that moment onwards, after questioning the Muslim brother for a couple of months, how he fulfilled my heart, everything he said just made sense. Everything he did, just his character, the way he was, just just made perfectly sense and that's something that I wanted for myself. From that moment onwards after I spoke to that priest and he took off, I made my mind up then and there that Islam was the haq and I wanted to be Muslim. And that very night I went to the brother's house and um, I asked him, I said I want to be Muslim, how do I do it? He got very happy, he hugged me and he took me to the Isha prayer at the Turkish mosque in Auburn. And I prayed Isha for the first time. And I always remember the day I stepped foot in my first mosque praying. It was like the feeling was, was like something, the weight, the weight of my life, the weight, it's like some weight was lifted off my shoulders. I felt light as a feather. I felt clean, I felt pure, I felt, it was a good feeling. It was a really good feeling. It was something I never felt before. It was, it was a better high than any drug I ever taken. Put it that way. I, I lined up in the ranks. We prayed Isha. After we prayed Isha, the brothers, they took me out at the back of the mosque in this little garage. There were about 15 brothers in there. And they were talking with me for about 15, 20 minutes, um, asking me, a bit about my life and who I was. And a lot of the Shabeb was there, that were there, I actually went to school with their brothers, I knew their cousins, um, and they, they were telling me that they're familiar who, who, who I was, uh, which made me feel a little bit more comfortable. And then I took the Shahada. And I'll never forget it. They got me to put my finger out, and I said, Ashadu illa ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulallah and from that moment uh, I felt very special very, on a high like I've never been before I just felt cleansed I felt pure I felt the burden of life was lifted off my shoulders um, I was so happy I was very very happy and the brothers embraced me and they hugged me and gave me the brotherly hug. And uh, it was a beautiful feeling. But when I say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I understood what this meant. Because of the knowledge I was getting from the brother prior to when I reverted, when I said the shahada, I understood that when I came to Islam, that I came into it completely. That I was in full submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From now on, from now on, I no longer lead my life through my ideas or my desires. That I'm led by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments. And when you're Muslim, you're in full submission to Him. So I realize that I'm in full submission and I've surrendered my life to Allah and Allah's way and Allah's way only. You don't, I understood very clearly that you don't leave one foot in Jahiliyyah and one foot into the deen. You plant two feet firmly and I understood that from day one. So from there I attained knowledge and I hung out with the brothers and the brother that I reverted through he held my hand for a good year, year and a half, uh, until I grew wings and flew myself, so to speak. But he was a very good brother, and may Allah reward him, inshaAllah. 
and he's still doing good works with the, with the youth today. And I think he's reverted, I think, 20 other people under his belt. So he's a brother that doesn't stop working. Uh, he's a brother that is very steadfast and he does not compromise the dean for anything or anybody. And that was also very attractive in that time when I was looking into Islam, how he never compromised his dean. That was an attractive thing, very attractive. I remember one time, just a short story, that I was with him at, at, on his job and I just reverted, must have been a couple of weeks, and this uh, very attractive lady, he used to go canvassing his company, and this very attractive lady pulled a hand out to shake his hand and he retreated and he put his hand in his heart and, and he said with the other hand, with all due respect for you and your husband, it would be wrong for me for my skin to touch your skin. And she was a little bit offended, but I was standing there going, SubhanAllah, there's no compromise in this din, not for anything or anybody. Alhamdulillah, and I understood that very clearly. Uh, just to move on quickly, back to the society issue. Look, brothers, I'm, I was from the Jahiliya, and I'm telling you, society is urging something. They want something. They just don't know what it is, but they want to change. They want something that their life doesn't really have a purpose, whether they know it unwillingly or willingly. But it's Islam is what they need, and it's Islam that is what they want. And it's for us to give it to them. It's our job. It's our job to, con to convey the message and to offer them an alternative to their system and offer them a an alternative to their societies. Because Islam and only Islam can change mankind and societies. It's only Islam that can do this. How, how long have I got? Brother? I've gone over. All right. Look, I'd love to say more, but uh, we've got some. Uh, I'll just end it there. Uh, I could talk on and on, but. Q &A look, session yeah, Q&A session. Yeah, Q&A session. You can ask questions and we can go from there. Um, there's some photos you might want to have a laugh at uh, later on. And I got a bit of a graph on how my uh, ideas and my uh, life changed from before and after in Islam. And you can go through it or give it a bit of a read. Uh, and you can see the transition, the way I used to think to the way I think now as a Muslim. Uh, Jazakallah for the opportunity, brothers. I hope you enjoyed my story. Uh, Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa